there is a sense in which the British cemetery in Kabul is a monument to the human spirit, a triumph of hope over experience. And as I stood there last Saturday on a chilly and foggy morning, I felt the eerie pathos of the place. It was here in 1842 that the Victorian catastrophist William Elphinstone was driven from his cantonment with a great rabble of camp followers. And it was not far from here that the knives of the Gilzai's rose and fell until the British army of Afghanistan was wiped out, almost to a man. Of Britain's 19th century presence in Kabul, there is now no legacy save this handful of broken gravestones, so defaced that you can hardly read the names of the dead except to see that one man had won a VC. They fell into decrepitude during Afghanistan's civil wars, and then the Taliban came and smashed them up again. And then, almost incredibly, in the 21st century, the Brits came back and repaired the cemetery. And there on the walls are fresh names of the British dead, of the 456 who gave their lives in the last 15 years from every part of the United Kingdom for the sake not of imperial glory, but in the hope of improving the lives of the people of Afghanistan. And when you look at those names, you imagine the pain of their families today back in Britain and the suffering of the many more who have been badly injured. And you ask yourself, what manner of people are we, the British, that we have come back here to this country, thousands of miles from home, and we keep sending our soldiers to lay down their lives? Why? With one in eight of the people born in this country now living abroad, a bigger diaspora than any other rich nation, you ask yourself, what impulse drives this astonishing globalism, this wanderlust of aid workers and journalists and traders and diplomats and entrepreneurs? Because whatever that feeling is, it isn't xenophobia. And I imagine there are people in this audience, this distinguished audience, today, who are wondering whether the next generation of Brits will be possessed of the same drive, the same curiosity, the same willingness to take risks for far-flung people and places. Because this is the year in which, as we periodically do, we did something that startled our friends and rivals. We voted to leave the European Union. And ever since that extraordinary vote on June the 23rd, there have been efforts to psychoanalyze the result and to impute bad motives to the British people. And there have been plenty who have been only too quick to draw comparisons with populist movements across the world. And all I will say is that we should not let these glib analogies replace individual analysis. In the famous words of Tolstoy, all happy families are alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And discontent can have subtly different wellsprings. There were plenty of people who voted to leave the EU. And I count myself as one who thought on these lines, not because they disliked or feared foreigners, but because they believed in democracy. And after 43 years, because they had still not come to endorse the finalité politique of the EU. And it is my passionate belief that there is no contradiction, whatever, between a trust in the nation state 
as the key building block of the global order and a generous and open mindset towards the rest of the world. And so my message to all those who are wondering, as Metternich supposedly did on the death of Talleyrand, what we meant by that is that Brexit emphatically does not mean a Britain that turns in on herself. Yes, a country taking back control of its democratic institutions, but not a nation hauling up the drawbridge or slamming the door. A nation that is now on its metal, a nation that refuses to be defined by this decision. A country galvanized by new possibilities and a country that is politically and economically and morally fated to be more outward looking and more engaged with the world than ever before. And when I speak of global Britain and the need for us to commit ourselves to the peace and prosperity of the world, I know there will be some who are wary that this sounds pretentious in a nation that comprises less than 1% of the world's population. I know there will be cynics who say we can't afford it. I say we can't afford not to. To those who say we are now too small, too weak, too poor, to have any influence on the world, I say in the words of Robert Burns, O oh, would some power the gifty gear us to see ourselves as others see us? Because there are plenty of people who do understand what this country can do and the effect it can have. And you will find them overseas. Indeed, there are probably a lot of British people who would not recognize the image of Britain, of ourselves, as seen through the eyes of others. I would not perhaps go as far as the people of Iran. Many of these, I'm told, are still convinced that we are the old fox manipulating America and Israel in such a way as to be effectively running the world ourselves a fact unbeknownst to most foreign policy experts. But I have been repeatedly impressed by the way people around the world are looking for a lead from Britain, engagement from Britain. So whether we like it or not, we're not some bit part or spear carrier on the world stage. We are a protagonist, a global Britain running a truly global foreign policy. And my message to you today, and I serve due warning, that this is the first in a series of speeches setting out our foreign policy strategy, is that this global approach is in the interests both of Britain and the world. And there are three reasons why this is so. The first is that it is in our interests to contribute to global stability, peace, order, the security to invest that is the bedrock of economic growth. And we have to acknowledge that the world is not now in good shape. Indeed, it is more dangerous and volatile than for several decades. We have the cult of the strong man. We have democracy in retreat. We have an arc of instability across the Middle East, from Iraq to Syria to Libya. Is it our answer to cower and put our heads under the pillow? Emphatically not. We know vividly and tragically that events in Afghanistan can affect our lives here in London. And that's partly why we are still there today. And it is in the interests of global order that we are at the center of a network of relationships and alliances that span the world. It's one of the great achievements of British diplomacy in the 20th century that together with others, we effectively change the basis and assumptions on which those relationships work. It was Britain in 1815 that helped to create balance of power system 
of politics, a system that was remarkably successful for about a century in keeping the peace until it could not cope with the rise of new states in the European order. And then we had the two world wars, which some historians now interpret as a single appalling event. And the, the end of that, 1945, we'd had what you might call a translatio imperi, a succession of empires. Hegemony had been transferred, and what A.J.P. Taylor called the War of the British Succession was won convincingly by the United States. And it was in that idealistic post-war period that on either side of the Atlantic there were attempts to build institutions that could answer these nagging questions of nations and nationalism. And a group of European countries responded to an instinct deep in the history of the continent and launched a project for a federal system of government with a single court, a single legal system, and of course, a customs union modeled on the Zollverein that was the precursor to a unified German state. It would be fair to say that Britain and America had a different approach. And together, they sought to create a new system based not on power, not on centralized and federal lawmaking, but on rules embodied by genuinely global institutions. Alongside our American ally, we were present at the creation of the United Nations, of the UN Charter, and later of, the, uh, of NATO, and later of the Helsinki Final Acts. And of course, Europe and North America ultimately worked together to build this new world. We stood together with our West European allies throughout the Cold War. And when that Cold War ended 26 years ago, we hoped that our rules-based liberal order would catch on and embrace the whole world. And alas, that vision has not really come to pass. And instead, the great attempt at a post-war liberal settlement is under unprecedented strain. The hard reality is that other nations were not swept along by the euphoria that I remember so well. Many of you remember. And there is a whole region of the world, the Middle East, where the nation-state system is itself in peril and where we are struggling against non-state actors who view the very concept of a global liberal order with contempt. And it is precisely because of the intensity of these challenges that we need to redouble our resolve to defend and preserve the best of the rules-based international order. If we fail, then we, we risk reverting to an older and more brutal system where the strong are free to bully or devour the weak, where might is always right, and the rules and institutions we have so painstakingly built fade away into irrelevance. We cannot allow this to happen. And so it is right that we stand shoulder to shoulder with America and others in the fight against Daesh. We are the second biggest contributor to the air campaign after the US, and that's why we work ever more intensively with our Five Eyes intelligence partners the United States, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, in a network of like-minded democracies that spans the globe. We work on security with our European friends. And as I, I've said before, our role is to be a, a flying buttress, supportive of the EU project, but outside the main body of the church. I, as I've said before, this was mistranslated by the EU interpreters as a flying bucket. But they, they, once, they, once, they, once they got the message and they understood the metaphor, uh, they, were, they were very happy with it. And uh, now, is the, now, is the, now is the time to build 
a new and productive relationship based on friendship and free trade, and a new European partnership where we continue to develop our work on things that matter to all of us in Europe. We are there with our EU friends. I've just been to a conference in Rome in the fight against piracy off the Horn uh, of Africa or in dealing with the migration crisis in the Mediterranean. Because we know that in keeping Britain safe, our security depends on stabilizing Europe's wider neighborhood. The southern Mediterranean, the ungoverned expanses of the Middle East and along the eastern borders of NATO. And there we find British troops already set to deploy in our enhanced forward presence in the Baltic states. Our resolve to fulfill NATO's obligations will be unbreakable. At the heart of this institution, NATO, the most durable and successful defensive alliance in history, lies the security guarantee contained in the North Atlantic Treaty, Article 5. That an attack on any one member shall be considered an attack against them all. And in offering that guarantee, President-elect Donald Trump has a point. It cannot be justified that one NATO ally, America, accounts for about 70% of the alliance's defense spending, while the other 27 countries manage only 30% between them. I want every NATO member to agree to meet the agreed target of spending 2% of GDP on defense and 20% of their defense budget on new equipment. Britain already abides by this target, and I note that NATO's most exposed members, including Estonia and Poland, do so as well. But as uh, Jens Stoltenberg, NATO Secretary General, has, has pointed out, there is no contradiction between de deterrence and dialogue. Britain is prepared to be tough with Russia. But that does not mean it is wrong to talk and to engage. Yes, it is Britain that it insists on our resolve to enforce sanctions against Russia for their occupation of Crimea and their hand in the war against eastern Ukraine. Uh, again, it's Britain that has been the firmest in denouncing Russia's part in the destruction of Aleppo. And for all those reasons, we can't normalize relations with Russia or go back to business as usual. But as I've said time and again, Russia could win the acclaim of the world by halting its bombing campaign of Syria, delivering Assad to peace talks, abiding by the letter of the Minsk agreements in Ukraine. I know that neither the Prime Minister, Theresa May, nor I will relent in our pressure or in delivering those messages face to face. But as global Britain, our range is not confined to the immediate European hinterland. As we see the rise of new powers, it is right that we should make a distinctive approach to policymaking as regards China and East Asia. Our approach must, in that region, must go beyond the quest for exports and commercial contracts, vital though they are. The emerging balance of power system in Asia needs the influence of friendly countries with our emphasis on the rules-based system in order to reduce the risk of miscalculation and unwanted confrontation. But one lesson that Britain has learned from centuries of evolutionary change in our own institutions is that you must be willing to reform a system in order to save it. We should be realistic enough to accept that the international order needs to change. That is why Britain supports enlarging permanent membership of the Security Council to other global powers, including India, and we were one of the first countries to join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is capitalized largely by China. And then there are some 
great international institutions that do not so much need to reform, but simply need a new burst of energy. And that brings me to the second area where global Britain can make a huge difference. Back in that post-war moment, the end of the Second World War, we not only helped to found NATO and the UN, it was J.M. Keynes who was instrumental in bringing to birth the Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF and the World Bank. And the next year, we helped to found the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the GATT, which I remember reporting so lovingly many years ago. Now the WTO, that over decades has helped to break down the folly of protectionism and open markets, a benign and transformative process that is not only good for Britain, since our trade amounts to nearly 60%, 60% of our GDP, but which is good for the world, lifting billions of people out of poverty in the last 40 years. And yet, the gossamer web of obstruction is growing thicker every year, and the political support for openness in trade is draining away across the world. And for the first time in decades, trade is no longer growing as fast as global GDP, with volumes rising by only 2.8% this year compared to an average of 5% since 1990. And since it is the world's poorest who will suffer most from this atrophy, it is our historic post Brexit function, as the Prime Minister has said, to be the leading agitators for free trade. Again, confounding those who are willing to misread Brexit by seizing this moment to campaign for openness and open markets across the globe, beginning with some of those dynamic Commonwealth economies that are already queuing up to do free trade deals. And then there is the third way that Britain, global Britain, can do good for the world and for itself. And that is the, the projection of our values and our, and our priorities. And we have enormous scope to do this because we are not only the second biggest defense spender in NATO, we also have the largest overseas aid budget in Europe. In the last five months, I have seen going around the world how Pretty Patel is making every pound count to change the lives of the neediest and to tackle the world's biggest and most intractable problems, not just poverty and disease, but mass migration, exhaustion of resources, and the consequent extinction of species. And if I may be permitted to take one example that obsesses me almost as much as it obsesses uh, my father, it is the tragic fate of the African elephant. It is mankind's privilege to share the planet with these magnificent and curious creatures, these throwbacks from the Pleistocene. And it is heartbreaking to see that their numbers have shrunk from 1.2 million in the 1990s to a mere 415,000 today. That is 110,000 elephants gone since 2006 in our lifetimes. And you all look as though you're going to live a long time. Even though you all look as though you're going to live a long time. They could be gone forever. Animals who have filled our imaginations since our childhoods and whose every attribute is a walking metaphor. And even if you don't care, you foreign policy experts, even if you don't care if they all get turned into umbrella stands or billiard balls, and even if you don't mind if our great-grandchildren grow up in a world without elephants, and I do mind deeply, let me suggest to you that the death of the elephant is a disaster that proceeds from other disasters. It's not just poaching. And the gangs that run the poaching are also, of course, the people who engage in human trafficking. But a massive growth in population that means a contest for resources that an elephant is never going to win. The population of Africa is now pushing a billion. And in many countries, it is doubling every 20 or 25 years. And what is the answer to this population boom? Which, by the way, global population growth is another of those things that we thought had got better. We thought we'd sorted it out 20, 25 years ago. We thought we were turning the tide. I'll give you one of the answers. I saw it in Pakistan the other day, uh, which has itself its own population 
boom, they're heading for 200 million people, 250 uh, in, in the next few years. In Pakistan, two-thirds, I'm afraid to say two-thirds of adult women cannot read or write. And I, I, I saw what we're doing to tackle this. I stood in a diffid funded classroom in the Punjab and asked the girls what they had been reading. What, I'm, sure, I'm sure you know what they'd been reading. The girls in the Punjab in a classroom. Any, any guess what, inter, what international superseller do you think they had been reading in the classroom in the Punjab in Urdu? Very good. No flies on you. Well done for, for following this speech so far. Uh, it, was a, it, it was, of course, Harry Potter. And I, uh, and, uh, and I tested them. I said, uh, I asked them who was the headmaster of Hogwarts School, this classroom of... Uh, and, 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 and you know what they said? Boris Johnson. No. <laughs> Thank you, Sam, for that. <laughs> they did not. Uh, they, they, you know what they said, Dumbledore. They were, they, and I don't know, of course, it was, it, was, it was extraordinary to see. They taught me all sorts of things I didn't know uh, about adenosine triphosphate and many other wonderful things. And it was, it was amazing to see uh, what, what was going on in that classroom and the way they were uh, responding to the education that, that we, we were funding. And of course, I suppose you could make a, a you could make it, and you can make. I will make a commercial case for Britain's interest in this. Yes, I mean the more girls who can read around the world, the more copies of Harry Potter that obviously that that you, that you can sell. Uh, but that isn't why that isn't why your money. I'm speaking to the Brits in this room, obviously uh, in this case, uh, British taxpayers' money is being used to teach now six million girls in the Punjab. That isn't why we're doing it. It's about giving them a chance to take control of their lives. All the evidence confirms that wherever women are empowered and educated, there are immediate improvements in the prosperity of that society and the stabilization of the birth rate. And with a world now likely to hit 11 billion people by 2050, not 9 billion as we thought a decade or so ago, but 11 billion people that British mission to educate young women and girls, to save them from the evil of modern slavery, to uphold our belief in equality wherever we go, is as profoundly in our interests as it is of girls in the developing world. We do not now run an empire, and it is a relief, frankly, to us that we don't, and perhaps to others as well. We are not the greatest military power on earth. We, of course, recognize the limits of what we can achieve on our own. But we should never underestimate the catalytic power of our creativity and the sheer concentration of intellectual resources to be found on this island. Of all the world's kings and queens and presidents and prime ministers, one in every seven was educated in Britain. We get that ratio up, I expect. Reduce it, depending on your... Cambridge University alone has produced more Nobel Prize winners and every university in Russia and China added together, multiplied by two. And I mean no disrespect to any university in Russia or China, by the way, when I say that. Uh, in the words of a Russian spectator at the Olympic opening ceremony, Britain wrote the soundtrack of the world. Britain is not just a link or a bridge between Europe and America. We're not merely the intersecting set of a complex Venn diagram, we have our own distinctive identity and contribution. And of course, like all nations who attempt to project their values overseas, we have our mistakes and our failures. And we should have the wisdom to know our limitations and to face the world with humility. But we should not let that proper sense of realism obscure the extraordinary things that we are capable of doing. And I end the conversation I had uh, with, with a conversation I had uh, last week in Afghanistan, uh, talking to President Ghani, a highly uh, intelligent guy, a Pashtun, whose forefathers, of course, cut down our troops in the passes in 1942, in 1842. And I have to admit that, uh, that he, he embarrassed me. Not because he railed at the British for the Durand line, 
or for our colonial misdemeanors. No, he thanked me profusely and repeatedly for the sacrifice of the 456 British troops who have given their lives and whose names I saw on that wall. And he was absolutely categorical that this time, this century, our legacy was positive and lasting. Millions of girls we've helped to teach in Afghanistan, fields that are now irrigated and cleared of mines, and some of the poorest and most isolated villages in the world now with a blessing of electricity thanks to the labor of British troops. And since I felt a little bit nonplussed at being thanked for things I personally had no hand whatever in delivering, I pass on those thanks to this distinguished foreign policy audience today. Britain has not always acquitted itself well in Afghanistan, and we in our generation have rightly found much to reproach in the vaulting jingo of our Victorian ancestors. But in sticking up for a liberal international order in the confusion and discord of the early 21st century, I believe this country is overwhelmingly a force for the good with the potential to do even more, and we should not be nervous of saying so. Thank you very much. Foreign Secretary, thank you very thank you. much. In your own inimitable style to have woven both Tolstoy and elephants into foreign policy. Yeah, is, is unusual here, to say the least. There are roving microphones uh, walking uh, around. I'm going to sort of move my way from left to right, if I may, if you can indicate a desire to ask a question. And I would stress it's a question and to be as brief as possible uh, in the third row back. Thank you very much. And if you could identify who you are and, as I say, affiliation. Um, John Ashmore from Politics Home. Um, Boris, just on Brexit, uh, what's your attitude to the possibility that the UK could continue to pay into the EU budget for certain trade uh, concessions? Uh, you, as you will uh, know, John, we have a strict policy of not giving a running commentary on our, on our negotiations, nor will I do so this morning since I'm talking about global uh, Britain. But I, I think you can take it that we will get the best possible deal in uh, goods and service to the benefit not just of uh, UK business, but of course of our friends and partners uh, on the other side of the channel. Lewis, uh, Chatham House. Foreign Secretary, you touched on the United Nations. We have a permanent seat on the UN Security Council. And in now leaving the European Union, of course, there'll be no more talk of a single European seat between us and France. So how will we lever this, if you like, newfound power that we might have, this new role in the United Nations? Well, uh, the, the UN, I believe, is a, is a, is a body that has... Uh, serve the world well, but is in, is in, in also could do, frankly, with a new surge of energy, as I, as I described. And we intend to be very active and very conspicuous in, in the UN and to be using uh, the UN Security Council to try to uh, deliver the results that we want to see. And as I've, uh, you, you've, seen, you've seen a lot of work by uh, Matthew Rycroft and our team in, in, in New York in the last few uh, weeks and months on, on, uh, on Syria, uh, on aviation security, on many other subjects where Britain is, is leading the world. And, and we, will, we see the UN as a, as a great forum uh, for global Britain to do that. I've, I've mentioned uh, our proposals to reform the Security Council. They don't yet uh, command uh, universal support, but uh, there they are. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, what unique sorry, could you introduce? I'm sorry, Robert Gardner, Chatham House. What unique characteristics do you bring to your new job, and which foreign secretary do you admire the most, and why? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 I hesitate to say what unique characteristics. But I'm, I'm, I, but just, I, I, I remembered this morning as I walked in here that my grandfather used to work at Chatham House. How about that? So you can't say I'm not, I don't have some, I, I manage, I've, I've managed strategically to litter the world with my ancestors. So uh, I, 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 I've got them, I've got them in, in Chatham House as well. So I suppose I've, that, that may, may be some aspect of, of, of uh, my formation that is relevant to, to foreign policy. But on, on, on who, which I 
George Nathaniel Curzon, a most superior person. Uh, I think, you know, a, a guy, I, I'll, I say, I've got to be careful what I say here, but um, I've just been struck talking to people. I, I, I mentioned the, uh, the warmth of the response that uh, unexpectedly and, and humbly, in, a, in a humbling way you, you, you get when you, you go around there. People genuinely remember when Britain has done something good as well as when we did something terrible. And, and a, a lot of previous British Foreign Secretaries have done some, some great things. Thank you. There's a hand at the back there. Curzon is the answer. George Nathaniel. My cheeks are pink, my hair is sleek. I dine at Blenheim twice a week. <laughs> was, the, was the conclusion of the, uh, of the rhyme, I think. <laughs> no, I don't. That was the... <laughs> <laughs> I think I may have dined a blend. <laughs> I'll, I'll get another question for you. <laughs> Please. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Foreign Secretary. Um, Sorry, could you identify yourself? Sure. I'm Lizzie Donnelly from the Africa Programme at Chatham House. I'm just wondering, in your ambition um, to both sustain and reform this rules-based international order, how does Africa fit in that in terms of its active role? Well, I, I, th I think we should, obviously, as, as, as you know, we are massively engaged, well, I can't see where you are, Lizzie, but we're, we're massively engaged in, in Africa, and uh, I'm doing a, a, a big trip there uh, next year to try and, try and take in as, as, as many uh, countries as we can. Obviously, it's, it's, it, the time is, uh, means I can't do as, as much as I would, uh, I would like in every, in every country. We spend a huge amount uh, in various Africa, only 300 million pounds a year of DFID funding in Ethiopia alone. Uh, I am concerned about some of the trends in Africa. You've seen what's happened with uh, the International Criminal Court where uh, some countries are, are moving away from the idea of, uh, of that international legal order. I, I, we, we want to champion that and to, to extol that, and that's, that's part of our work. Thank you. Gentleman right at the back there just to the right of centre. Hmm? Hello, Could sir. Could you tell us more about your foreign policy toward Asia? Thank you. Our, well, I thank you. Thank you, sir. Our, po our policy towards Asia is, as I, as I said earlier on, to uh, to engage, but not to, just to, to see this as, a, as an opportunity to build our, our commercial relations, uh, huge though they are, growing though they are, and, and vital though they are. I, and uh, I had a great trip out to uh, Japan a, a, a year or so ago and, and saw the, the, the potential for, for growth in what is already a, a very, very strong uh, relationship between our two countries. But as, as I said, global, uh, global Britain uh, can see that there may be stresses and, and tensions in that region. And our job, we think, is to continue to emphasize the importance of the, of the rules-based international order and uh, to, not to be afraid of, of saying so. And that's what we're going to do. Thank you. So about three rows further and then in. To the lady there, hand up. Oh. No. Oh. Oh, sorry. Claudia Hamill, a member of Chatham House. What's your top priority, um, Brexit with the EU or foreign affairs on a bilateral basis? Well, I, th I don't know whether you, you, you've... Um, my own personal maxim in life in respect of cake is that I, I'm, I'm, I'm pro having it and pro eating it. So I see, I see, I see look, I mean, th these are two important things that need to be got right. As, as you know, there's a department for exiting the European Union that's uh, headed up by David Davis. So the, so the negotiations on that... Uh, are, are taking place with, with, with DEXU. Our job is, uh, in the Foreign Office is to engage uh, with our friends and partners across the EU and to, to make sure that they understand that each bilateral relationship is going to remain very strong, if not stronger, and also that our relationship with the EU will be, as I said, a, a very dense, thick, uh, continuous relationship developing in all sorts of ways where we can do work together. And I highlighted some of the things that we want to do, and I, and I explained the, the metaphor of the, of the flying buttress and, and, and so on. So that, that all, I think, is, is, is going well. But I see no, I see no need to um, 
that, that in no way impedes our, our work with the rest of the world, where, as I said, the Brexit decision needs to be seen as something that is putting us on our metal, encouraging us to uh, be more outward-looking, more engaged uh, with the world uh, than ever before. And, 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 and to not only to, to get out there uh, and, 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 and engage, but also to explain to the British people quite what we're doing. Because I think the, the stunning thing I find is how little people, my constituents in Uxbridge and South Ryslip probably really know of Britain's overseas engagement. They, people, I don't think people know quite what we are doing and what we are achieving around the world. So I see one of my jobs is to try to, try to express that. Thank you. There was a lady with a hand up two rows behind Claudia, and then in the front row here. Oh, close. <laughs> Go on, sir. <laughs> Michael Burton, member of Chatham House. Foreign Secretary, in fulfilling your vision of a global Britain, are you confident that your department, the Foreign Commonwealth Office, has the resources, uh, the standing in Whitehall, the people, to fulfill what sounds like a, a greatly heightened role? Uh, thank you for that excellent question. And uh, I, I am immensely proud of the Foreign Office. I think they're an extraordinary group of people. Uh, don't forget that we have a bigger network than France with only 75% of the, of the budget. Sorry, not to, where, where's one of my French, uh, uh, our French colleagues? I don't wish in any way to be, uh, uh, provoke uh, jealousy from France. Uh, but that is the, that is the, the reality. We do, they do an extraordinary job. And um, yes, of course, there are, there are, there are always pressures on, on budgets. Uh, but I think it is vital for... Uh, our central government to understand the, what I've tried to explain in, the, in, in my speech, the benefits to us in the UK from stability, from commercial potential, of, from expressing our values overseas, as a, a, of engagement. And it, it repays its investment many, many times over to have a, a strong an outward-looking policy towards the world, and that's what we're going to have. And I, I'm, I'm fortified uh, in my conviction that all will be well because the current Chancellor used to do my job, and I'm, I'm sure he will see things that way. <laughs> exactly. Uh, hello, Trisha de Borgrave. I'm a writer. Thank you for coming Thank today. Um, what is better for Britain? A strong EU? An EU that's going to disintegrate? What is better for Britain? No, we must be very... I, I'm sorry if I didn't make that, that clear in my, in my speech. We want a strong EU and we want a strong relationship between a strong UK and a strong EU. It is no part of our agenda to seek to undermine or to be dog in the manger-ish about the, about the EU. Now, if, if, and there's a conversation going on now about the EU's desire to build a common security and uh, defence policy, new architecture for that. You know... If they want to do that, fine. Obviously, they should also spend 2% of their GDP on, on defence. It might be the first thing to, 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 to get right. But we are not there to block or to impede further steps towards uh, EU integration, if that is what they so desire. Uh, we are there to support and to build a strong, thick uh, relationship. Thank you. Gentlemen, with the microphone. Uh, Foreign Secretary Phil Chambers, member of Chatham House. Um, you speak of Britain being more engaged with the world, yet you've also referred to an era of the cult of the strongman. I think particularly to, to Russia, uh, an allusion to Russia in this regard. How do you envisage Britain being able to engage uh, in, in this uh, current, and, uh, current world order where I think, um, as you say, there is a significant challenge to the um, Where is Phil? Is that there? Sorry. Yeah. Where there's significant challenge um, to the liberal order that has been established for the last 50 years, and how do you envisage Britain being able to engage with such actors, uh, particularly Russia, going forward? I think you've got to be strong, and you've got to be firm. And I think the, the uh, people will push and push and push until they meet a push back. And so uh, when it comes to, to sanctions or... Uh, or whatever, you've, you've, got to, you've, got to, you've got to remain absolutely solid in what you're, in what you're doing and you've got, to, you've got to stick up for what, you're, what you believe and not be, not be afraid to, to say so. Gentleman in the middle there, then we'll go across. 
across to the right. Bijan Ruhi, uh, Foreign Secretary, thank you. Uh, what role do you think global Britain can play in reconciling the relationship between the United States and Iran? Where's Bijan? I'm here. Bijan, thank you. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a supporter of the opening to Iran, the, the, the JCPOA. I think that's the, the right way forward. And, you know, that's one of the conversations that we'll need to be having with the uh, the American administration to be, to, to see where they are, but also to try and stress some of the positives uh, that have come out of this, the, the growth in trade that we're seeing between the, the UK and Iran. It's not as big as we, we would like, but it's, 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 it's growing. Uh, that's a fantastic thing. I, I, I spoke a lot about trade in my speech because I, I really believe that that is the, in so many cases, you look at where, when the world gets into a bad place, as it did in the 1930s, it's because trade falls away. Trade is now falling away in a way that echoes previous eras. We need to get it moving again. And, and trade with Iran, I think, is very important in that respect. There's a lady in the front row, if you could. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Foreign Secretary. Benedict Pavieux, France 24. You talked about Benedict. finalité politique. Oui. Oui, effectivement. Um, <laughs> Do you personnellement, do you personally yes. support freedom of movement? Are, Are you taking no. one position in private and a directly contradictory stance in public? Mais non. Uh, I, uh, Are you je sure? Reste, je reste uh, absolument fidèle. Sur, uh, I, I've, always, I've always been uh, clear in my, in, my, in my view. In fact, I, a couple of EU ambassadors have been nice enough in the, since this uh, story uh, emerged to, to get in touch with me and say that they remember me saying exactly what I uh, say I've said, which is that I'm a liberal internationalist. I believe, in, I believe that immigration can do great things. And I've, I've supported, when I was mayor of this fantastic city, I saw the strength and dynamism that immigration gave to, uh, helped to give to, to the London economy. Uh, but what I also said at that breakfast, and, uh, and the, I, th I think I see some veterans of that occasion uh, here. Uh, maybe I don't, maybe, they, maybe, they've, maybe they've decided to give it a miss. Or, I do see some veterans. I see some veterans of that occasion. They will recall that what I said was, uh, important though EU uh, migration had been, uh, we had to have control. I hear them say exactly, and I'm delighted. <laughs> and I, I, therefore, I thereby declare that ludicrous story, convincingly refuted, and, uh, and, I, and I, hope we, I hope we can therefore move on. Uh, can I give it to my colleagues? Why, yes, why not? Uh, Ragi Omar Ragi. from ITV News. Uh, Boris, uh, I'd like to ask about Syria. Uh, yeah. Do you think the facts on the ground still make our position uh, that there can be no future uh, without President Bashar al-Assad. Is that still a realistic position given the facts on the ground? And secondly, just your comment about the uh, Richmond by-election, whether it, you think it's a vote against a hard Brexit or not. Uh, first of all, on, on Richmond, all I really want to say, on, on Zach Goldsmith, as a, a great friend of mine, I just want to say how sad I am that Zach is, is no longer going to be in the House of Commons. I think he made a remarkable contribution to, uh, in, in his time there and uh, fought a, uh, was heroic and principled in standing up for what he believed in on Heathrow expansion. And uh, he will be missed, but he will, be, he will certainly be back. Uh, on, on Syria... Look, you know, of course there are now uh, people who are saying the kind of thing that, uh, that you've just suggested. But you've got to look at where we, where we are, uh, which is that after five years of slaughter, Bashar al-Assad is responsible for the overwhelming majority of the deaths of the 400,000 uh, that we've lost in Syria. There are millions of people in that country who, in our view, will not accept rule by him again. And I think that the answer has got to be a political answer, whereby we move away from Bashar al-Assad's rule, we find another way forward, and a, a, a future for Syria that retains, a, a, as I say, a united country. And I, for the, with the best will in the world, uh, Raggy, I can't see that happening under, under Assad. So, 
he's, we got to move away. Yes. Sorry, no. Yeah, no, no. Stuart, we'll, you're we'll, in charge. We'll, I don't want to we'll, use we'll, that we'll, we'll, well, there and then to that. Sam, Sam yes. Go on. You then, Sam. Sam. Go, sorry. Thank you, Alex Shellam, member of Chatham House. Foreign Secretary, you've made use of uh, E-word this morning. When it comes to foreign policy, to what extent would you consider yourself an expert? An expert? Indeed. <laughs> well, look, I'm not, I, 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 think, I, I think there was quite a lot in my speech about humility. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, which is always a worrying thing. In any, uh, but I, 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 I'm conscious that there are, there are many people in this room who know an awful lot about uh, all sorts of fields, not least uh, a good sprinkling of, of, of serious Foreign Office uh, strength I see uh, over there. Uh, all we, got, we seem to have got most of the ambassadorial core. There's a huge wealth of wisdom in this room. Uh, but I, I hope to draw on that wisdom uh, in the months ahead and, to, as I say, to help uh, use that to, to, to build a truly global Britain foreign policy. Sam, I think you had. Uh, foreign Secretary, the... Sorry, you... uh, uh, sorry Sam Kiley, Sky News. Uh, foreign Secretary, you... The, 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 the referendum was on leaving the European Union. There was no... A mandate, as far as I can see, for restrictions on the movements of labour, uh, on whether or not the United Kingdom remains part of a customs union. Where do your red lines on these issues lie? And secondly, your Prime Minister, prior to the vote, uh, was very adamant that the United Kingdom would leave the uh, European Convention on Human Rights, which is a pillar of the rules-based international structures. Uh, do you endorse that? Well, I, I am not, uh, Sam, as you would expect, I am not going to deviate one inch uh, from what the Prime Minister has rightly said already, which gives, I think, to most people who understand the workings of the EU, a very, very clear picture of how we intend to proceed. And the Prime Minister has already said that we will cease to apply European law, EU law in this country, or the judgments of the, of the European Court, and she has said that we will use this moment, as I said earlier on, to do free trade deals and to be an agitator for, for global free trade. I think you can, from, from those two points, I think you can dr draw all the necessary conclusions about how we uh, see the future. And it's a very exciting future for both Britain and uh, the, the rest of the EU. What about the question of the European Convention on Human Rights? A pillar of the international legal order. Well, the, the, on, that, uh, on that matter, the government's policy is, as I love saying, the government's policy is unchanged. I, I'm going to have to disappoint you because, unfortunately, the Foreign Secretary has a hard stop at 9.30. Depending on whether I look at that clock, which is 9.30 and this one, 9.31, I think, I think I'm afraid that that is the end. So can I, on behalf of all of us here and thank the very you. many watching online, thank you. Thank Foreign you very Secretary. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And 